You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! again to truth justice in the new england pro wrestling way this is a scary episode it's the halloween episode everyone and as always my name is matt spectro aka tarzan taylor and i'm joined by my co-host or fellow host he's a former liberty states heavyweight champion and a man whose favorite horror movie franchise is nightmare on elm street julian star hey what's going on everyone um, I feel like we're going to have a somber episode today because it's very early in the morning. <laughs> I didn't go to bed till 3 a.m. because we were celebrating my older brother's birthday. Uh, happy birthday, John. He just turned 32. And uh, I assume you haven't gotten much sleep, pal. Nope, nope. My daughter was born just a couple of weeks ago. Congratulations. Thanks. She keeps me up a lot. But happy Halloween, everyone. Yeah. That's my favorite holiday, you know? It's, um, it's, Tied for my favorite holiday. What's your first? Christmas. Why? I don't know, just something about the snow, the music, the the gift giving, the whole nine yards. See, that's the whole thing I hate about Christmas is I cannot stand Christmas music. I think it's <laughs> like it's genuinely like too cheerful, which is what bothers me. I just it sounds falsely happy. And <laughs> I just, I, I don't know. There's something about it being as cheerful as it is, is what annoys me the most. And you hate fun? Uh, well, no, I don't hate fun because <laughs> I like hanging out with my buddies. But um, which is your favorite of the Nightmare on Elm Street films? Um, it's Halloween and it is your fun fact of the yeah, week. Yeah, yes, I do. I do like Nightmare on Elm Street. It's my favorite. Uh, I'm trying to, I don't like Dream Warriors. What? I, I don't because I don't like how i don't like the whole like magic and like you know what i mean like everyone has like superpowers uh, and stuff you. i didn't really like that one so much is i like it just being a typical slasher um probably the i know it's gonna sound crazy but i think the last one um nightmare on elm street the remake yeah uh well not the not the remake that the that the new actor was in it's like the the last one remember like new nightmare is that what you're saying the one where i don't like, remember no so, the land camp came back and uh, yeah and she has like a son and yes, yes okay that was new nightmare okay yes that's that might be my favorite because it feels more i don't know just like a horror slasher i guess but like nothing too magical but i know you catch you in your dreams so it's I know it's a, a weird balancing act, but that might be my favorite one. You dressing up this year? I am. <laughs> I am. I I want to be Freddy Krueger because I have a four hundred dollar mask. Goodness. Yeah, it's it's like movie quality. Um, I'll show it to you. But it's Freddy Krueger, and I wanted to wear it, but Freddy Krueger's not three hundred pounds, so <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to be Freddy Krueger with diabetes or something. Well, we are the premier podcast of uh, exclusively about New England pro wrestling. Why don't you tell all the people what our podcast is all about? Well, this podcast is about trying to get the truth. People in professional wrestling tend to be a bit too political, a bit too friendly. Well, Truth, Justice, and the New England Pro Wrestling Way is looking to break that mold. As Tarzan and I sit down with various guests discussing multiple topics, but trying to gain the point of the truth. We will dig, we will probe, no matter how uncomfortable it may become, we will be sure to deliver truth Justice and the New England Pro Wrestling Way. All right, and speaking of New England Wrestling, a uh, pretty exciting event this uh, past month. Uh, All Elite Wrestling made their New England debut. Yeah, AEW ended up in Boston shooting for their show Dynamite, which airs on Wednesdays. Um, yeah, it was it was pretty crazy because we didn't even know about it until our friend Michael Crockett made us aware in the group chat. Yeah. I didn't even know they were the coming to Boston, but um doesn't watch the product is the one filling us in on it. <laughs> well, he reads the dirt sheet, so but um I really wish I had known sooner because I probably would have bought tickets to go. Uh it was fun. It was it was good. Um I think AEW is going to do well. That show itself was pretty decent. The argument I'm having with a lot of people is uh, they're 
their matches are good, but there's a lot going on in them. And it's like you're it's I was talking to Brandon Locke about it. It's like um, you might know this, the whole like hot shot deal when you hot shot everything and then you blow your load and basically like what are you going to give them next? Uh-huh. You know what I mean? And now I feel like that's how the match, they're going to be like, oh, cool, more dives and more super kicks and more. It's just, it's going to, I feel like that act's going to get old quick. Um, so I think right now, because it's new, it's fresh, and WWE has ran the the gauntlet for, or not the gauntlet, but ran the business for over a decade now by themselves, where you have an alternative, they're going to blow up for a while. But I feel like that act's going to get old pretty quick. You feel the New England crowd took to it? Oh yeah, absolutely, they took to it, and and that's that's pretty normal here. I feel like New England is like we always say the hotbed for professional wrestling, and I feel like a lot of our fans in this area right now are heavily indie, uh, indie oriented, where a lot of them like the indie stuff way more than the the main product. Um, so I, I they genuinely enjoyed it. Some of the matches were great. Some, not so much. Care to guess which one I didn't like the most? <laughs> um, I, uh, woman's match? Yeah, <laughs> now you're getting it. All right, so before we get to this week's guests, are you ready for trivia? No, I'm not. It's, <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's past 9 a.m., but I got up at 8 a.m. Anyone I'm... new to the show, every week I ask Julian a trivia question about New England pro wrestling, and then if he does not answer it, we give our guest the opportunity to answer it. So far, Julian's one and one. So yeah, well, even playing field, you ready, ready to go over uh, 500? <laughs> yeah. All right. The date, May 1st, 2010, Somerset, Massachusetts. New England Championship Wrestling presents their seventh annual Iron Eight. What current WWE superstar won that Iron Eight? Mike Bennett. Uh-huh. <laughs> Stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to ask our guests, and uh, that's now you're now uh, one and two now, yeah, Julian. I really thought it was Mike Bennett. <laughs> I was so confident. <laughs> All right. Are you ready to get on with the Halloween episode? That I am, sir. All right. This week is a special Halloween episode. No tricks, no treats. It's <laughs> the man behind the curtain where we talk to one of the people behind running a wrestling company in the New England area. This week, we're talking about Atlantic Pro Wrestling, and we're going to introduce our guest. He is the co-owner and co-booker of Atlantic Pro Wrestling. All right. Welcome to the show, Michael Morris. How you doing, gentlemen? You're good. How are you, sir? Good. I'm good. I'm yeah. Glad to be here. Me too. You've been lobbying to get on this podcast forever. We finally yeah. got you on. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> I just want to give a perspective of, you know, someone who's only been in the business for like two years. Yeah. So, That's good. Usually everyone we talk to has been around forever and is better. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, I mean, hey, Dave, don't get me wrong. There have been some bitter days yeah. in the short two years. What but. is your favorite horror movie franchise? Um, I actually am not a big horror movie fan. But <laughs> really? If, if I had to pick, it would probably be the first horror movie I ever saw uh, franchise would be Friday the 13th. Oh, nice. I mean, because I'm a lot older than most. I mean, I'm almost 50 years old. So Yeah, but uh, well, I, I guess I can't judge. But um, I've never been a Friday the 13th fan. I hmm. just, I've tried to watch them and I just, I can't get into it. But uh, so we're going to discuss the company that you are, Conor Booker, Atlantic Pro Wrestling. Before we get into that, though, I'm going to ask you the trivia question. The date. May 1st, 2010, Somerset, Massachusetts, New England Championship Wrestling presents the 7th Annual Iron 8 Tournament. What current WWE superstar won that tournament? The only one that comes to the top of my mind right now is, is Oni Lorcan. <laughs> oh. Ladies and gentlemen, the answer to that trivia question, the winner of the 7th Annual Iron 8 in 2010 was none other than one half of the Viking Raiders, Ivar. Boo. At that point, known as Handsome Johnny. What, uh, what else? What other monikers did he have? He was also the Duke of Elegance. Oh, yeah. And, and <laughs> the brand new bad. Yes. As well as Warbeard Hanson. All right. We're going to go to our topic today. You know, I, I don't know. That's the first first week our guest beat you. Yes. Second week you got it right. This week, neither of you answered it. We have a different result every time. <laughs> Atlantic Pro Wrestling. I uh, did a little research. Looks like it opened in 2011. But you were not part of the company at that point in time. Looks like you came aboard in 2017. Now, before we get into that, give us a little bit of, you know, what made you decide pro wrestling was something you wanted to get involved with? Julian knows this, but I'm really good friends with uh, Brawler Malonis, Brian Malonis. Ring of Honor Superstar. Ring of Honor Superstar, their chaotic wrestling product. 
New England darling, I guess you would say, loved throughout the area of New England. Um, so I was talking to him. Well, we worked together during the week, in our daily jobs, and he said that Chaotic may be looking for someone who could run their social media. Um, so he had reached out to Jamie Janikowski, who was the owner at the time, um, but it had turned out that he had just recently made a deal with uh, the Strong, strong uh, Style brand, Frankie, to start doing their social media, their production, and all of that. So he introduced me to the owner of APW, Joe Moakley. Um, originally, I was going to start doing just the social media because I had, um, as I told you earlier, I had a podcast myself that focused on mixed martial arts. I grew my followership up to over 15,000 people on Twitter, a couple thousand on Facebook. Um, but there were rumblings that APW's doors were going to close if so, Joe didn't have somebody to come in and help him out. So we sat down, we talked it over uh, for minimal, you know, minimal cash out of my pocket. Um, I was able to um, become part owner of the company and learn the business. And, and I've been lucky. I've had some great mentors. Brian's taught me a lot about how to work backstage. Johnny Vegas has given me some input. Um, but the person I would probably say gave me the most knowledge or the most guidance, believe it or not, is Mike Mike King, Stiff Mike or Apocalypse, however you know him. Yes. Uh been around. He's a you know former killer he's a killer Kowalski student, trains and owns Wrestling Academy Revival. Um but he has been probably the number one person that if I have an issue or need information, he's the one I go to. Uh, for that. So so that's, you know, and being a wrestling fan, I mean, the first wrestling match I ever saw on television was when Hulk Hogan beat the Iron Sheik in 1984, I think it was. Um, and it just grew from there to watching, you know, flipping back and forth through the Monday Night Wars and Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock. And, and it just grew. And being a, having a creative mind and, and being able to see, you know, where even on TV, the storylines were going to go. I thought that that, you know, was something that I would be able to help with, you know, Joe and, and keep Atlantic pro wrestling alive and which we've done a great job of not only improving the product, but growing the product, uh, with the help of, you know, guys like Sonny Goodspeed giving us advice and Johnny Vegas and, and, and getting away from the old days and the old, feelings that people had about APW as a backyard organization, I guess you would say. Um, we'll get back to that later on the podcast. But uh, So how many um, owners are there now in Atlantic Pro Wrestling? There are just two. It's just my, two. Myself and Joe Moakley is still my partner. And you went in. Um, was this something that occurred to you before, like owning part of a company? Or is this something that the idea presented to you and your mind was like, whoa, all right, maybe this is something I can do? It was... Um, Again, like I said, originally I went in, it was social media. I was going to help him build his brand. And then um, the rumblings about the closing and Joe and I had a conversation. And that's where it, it stemmed from was he needed somebody to help him after um, Big Woody left. Big Woody was a big part of APW. Uh, you know, may he rest in peace. Um, so I kind of stepped in and started helping Joe out in that sense and to help with the company. So is Joe like, if you had to like put rankings in, is Joe like realistically like the Vince McMahon of APW? I don't think we really look at it that way. Okay. I think Joe and I are 100% on a 50-50. Uh, I mean, it's gotten to the point where it's scary. Like we'll be typing something about a match that we want to pull off. And literally hit send at the same time, and it, it's the exact same thought, the exact same result, maybe just worded differently in the in the message. Okay, so you guys are cohesive and working together really well. Yeah, absolutely, okay, perfect. Yep. Just uh, you had no experience in the business at all before this, none whatsoever. And um, any trepidation being, you know, that you had none in the business walking in, and now you're in this really prolific role. Yeah, I mean, obviously you hear the stories about, you know, people thinking, oh, he's Joe, he's being brought in because he's a money mark or he's he's this, he's that, you know, um, how are the boys going to, in the locker room, how are they going to treat this individual who doesn't have the background, who's never been in the ring, never bumped? 
I think the way I approached it was is I gave everybody an open forum. And and from day one, when the announcement was made, uh, which we can, I can tell you a funny story about that. Uh, May of 2018, we had our first show back at the Elks. And Joe um, gave the speech to the locker room beforehand, introduced me and literally said, Oh, and he's the co-owner of APW. And that was the first official time that it was made announced to the guys in the back. Um, so, but no, to answer your question, no, I never had any inkling of, of coming in. But the fear of being viewed as someone who was naive in the business scared me. But I felt that the way I was going to approach it in my business knowledge of how I could improve things business-wise was going to win over the locker room. So you said you've always wanted to be involved in professional wrestling um, since the time you were a fan. Why, like what made you go the owner route? How come you didn't actually try to become a performer, like a wrestler or a manager or an interviewer or something along those lines? Uh, honestly, it's uh, one, a lot of it has to do with my age. I've had multiple back surgeries. I did get in the ring and I tried to bump three or four times. And on the fourth time, I whacked my head pretty good and, <laughs> and was dizzy and and just felt that that wasn't the part for me. But I, I made sure that I went to classes every day and I watched the trainers at work. At one point, APW, Joe Moakley, owned Wrestling Academy Revival. So I went every Monday, Wednesday, Saturday. I watched Demon Ortiz, Luis Ortiz, the head trainer. I watched Stiff Mike. I went to the seminars when they were doing them with Brian or Mike Hollow. And I learned, you know, from them just sitting outside the philosophy of what goes into matchmaking, what goes into communicating in the ring. And I think that helped me a lot when it came to storylines and helping lay out matches. Um, so this is, you said the, it's Newberry Port, correct? That's the, uh, the city that, uh, yep. okay. Newberry, Newberry Port, <laughs> Massachusetts. Yep. All right. So when you came in, was it a hard negotiation? Was it like, all right, we're going to do this and I'm going to be booking. You're going to do this. We're going to do everything 50, 50. How was it approached? No, it was approached that, you know, we both sat down and said, we're going to have a budget for every show. Um, obviously we want to be financially, you know, financially, um, stable and, you know, Joe's like, I'm going to have you reach out to the, the people, kind of learn how to book and, and negotiate with people. Um, so I did that for the first, you know, first five or six shows, and it started to go well. So pretty much I took over all of the communication. Joe Joe is more, Joe sits back, Joe does the storylines, Joe helps me. We lay out cards together. We lay out who we want to bring in, fresh faces, who who we want to have take three or four shows off because they've kind of been, you know, they've washed out or whatever you want to call it with um, overused to give them a, give the fans a break from seeing them. And then that way when they return in four shows, it's, it's a little bit of a surprise to the fans. Cause that's the one thing we try to do is like do things for the fans that are going to want them to come back and that they're not expecting. All right, so the very first show, did you were you just there and you're the owner, or were you actually did you help put that show together of this is gonna happen? Or was that just like the beginning of an intro, now you're an owner and then go yeah, from there? That right there, that was more me just kind of standing back, seeing how everything went from loading the truck to, you know, end of the day. Um, Joe built that entire card because it was a, a build up. It was a it was the show where Joe was finally going to lose the APW Heavyweight Championship on uh, uh, after a hair versus hair match with Cody or uh, Hunter Ward, um, who is his Joe's rival, um, and then Danny Miles would ultimately cash in to end the show, which was by far the best thing for APW because I think that there was this perception that Joe Moakley having the title as the owner of the company was putting himself over, which, you know, Todd Sopel, I know, mentioned that on a previous show. Yes, he did. However, when Joe sits down and explains it to me, it was, he was originally supposed to be the bridge. He was only supposed to have that title for a couple of shows, and then someone else was going to win the title. They had a plan for someone else, but that person no longer wanted to wrestle. They pretty much just walked away from the business. So it ended up Joe having the title for the good part of a year. 
I, I know what Todd said about whole putting the title on yourself because you're who you can trust and yada, yada, yada. But I feel like there's a lot of talent out there that you can trust. And putting the title on yourself is it's 50-50 with me. I just I, I really do believe that it is a markish move. Um, I don't believe that promoters or whatever who do that have, you know, this whole, oh, I can, I can trust myself and yada, yada, yada. Because, and, and here's why. Look at the people who do it. And and this isn't a shot at Todd Sopel or Joe, but like they don't work anywhere else. They don't get booked anywhere else. So they're not acknowledged anywhere. And now they're acknowledging themselves and putting the most prestigious title on them. I mean, you can't stare at me and say that you don't have you don't have it in question that Joe's not, you know, being a mark for himself and putting himself over. I know he's pitching it to you like it's a business move, but you can't you're going to could you sit across from me right now and tell me that there isn't a thought in your head that like, "Nah, you're being a mark right now, dude." I would say that <clears throat> you know, Joe telling me the reasons why he put the title on himself or his reasons. Mm-hmm. And that's why the plan was from day one, when when I became a partner, that we were going to get the title off it, off of off of Joe, and we not only got the title off of Joe, but we rebranded with new logo, new championship belt, all debuted on that one show, and it was imperative that we got the title off of Joe because Joe was going to do more of the back of the house stuff and less of the wrestling, and so I wasn't part of the company. Do I agree that Joe? Probably could have found somebody else to wear the title and represent APW. Absolutely. I mean, you had Hunter Ward, who is over with the APW fans. You had Stiff Mike. You had John Poe, although John Poe had retired at the end of the previous year. But you still had guys like Big Gun. Whatever you think of of the people that are regulars at APW, the fans love them. So were there better options? Probably. But Joe had his reasons. And, you know... I, I would say that if Joe came to me today as his business partner and said, I think we need to put the title on back on me, I would be, hell no. I, I would It would be 100%. I would rather put the title on uh, somebody who comes in for the first time, wins the title, kind of like what they did. I think they did it back in the day with Demon Ortiz and John Walters, I think. Yeah. D- John came in and beat Demon in one match mm-hmm. and then lost it eventually. So... I look at it as that is not good for our company. That is a markish thing to do. It is. And and because like it's like you just said, um think about someone who has been um really faithful to your for APW. Stiff Mike has been there I think since the beginning. You could easily put that belt on Stiff Mike and I'm sure he's at a point in his career right now where he's like, "Yeah, sure. I'll help people get over, do whatever I got to do." You bridge the belt on him and then someone quits, at least you have it on an active wrestler that's not owning the company and creating different opinions on people because as you said, people had this mindset of like, "Oh, you know, our owner is putting the championship on him. Cool." You know, I just, it's just, I'm just venting a lot, but, um, I just, I, it's a fishy thing to me when promoters put belts on themselves. Um, I, something just doesn't seem right. And a lot of the times it's typically the unpopular who do it. So it's hard for me to say that they're not being a mark for themselves. I mean, did it even make you nervous at all going into this, knowing you're kind of partner with a guy who has the title on himself? Um, I don't think that made me nervous because I knew that on the first show as being partner of the company that Joe was losing the title and he was removing himself from the title picture. I think, honestly, Joe did finish out the year in 2018 with um, his group Venom, but I think, honestly, Joe has wrestled on one card in 2019. He's been mostly in the back doing... You know, running music, uh, helping, helping. We we've changed it up a little. We we put agents on matches. Like we have Amato Figueroa, who is one of our one of our uh, more senior guys, been mm-hmm. in the business for twenty plus years. He is one of the backstage agents for matches. Stiff Mike is some is an agent for matches. When we have Brian Malonis there, he helps us out. When we and we've started giving Sonny Goodspeed some responsibility as agents. So. 
really Joe and I are now the final say. So if we draw up the rundown and we have a finish that says this is how a match is going to finish by pinfall and someone that comes up with a better idea and they bring it to their agent for the match and then the agent brings it to us and explains it and Joe and I have final say of any changes that need to be made. Uh, and I'm only going to ask this question because, and I don't know if this popped up near Tarzan, but what Tarzan always explained to me is um, he was heavily micro, well, not heavily, but he was micromanaged to a point as a booker, whereas like, and again, this has to do with the fact that he, and he understood, but didn't, like he understood, it was just annoying. Uh, when Tarzan booked, Tarzan wasn't using his own money. I don't know if you know this. Tarzan Taylor was a booker. <laughs> Hasn't come up yet. But anyway. uh, <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, Tarzan Taylor was a booker for Chaotic Wrestling. Uh, what year did you book? Uh, 2011 to 2000. 14 i think perfect so when he was booking um a lot of times you know how you said they have a final say and yada 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 um he had to go through jamie he's spending jamie's money to get this done so jamie had to ixnay this ixnay that i said no to this i'd rather this this is the finish i want this is the thing i want this is what i need and so my question for you is they're spending your money correct Mine and Joe's, yeah. So do you micromanage a lot, or do you trust the boys or who you have empowered to do their job? I, we, to, we trust that um, they're going to stick to the game plan or the layout that Joe and I have come up with. And, for example, recently on October 19th, we had our annual Gilbonk Wrestle Royal. Um, we needed Big Gun requested to go in number one. So we put Big Gun in at number one, and we had, you know, we had it laid out how it was going to work. And later in later on, his tag team partner, who he is now feuding with, was coming to the ring. So that needed to happen exactly the way that we wanted it to happen to come across to the crowd. So there was no changing that, and we made that clear when we put the match together. So. It was stuck to. But there are times, like for example, more recently, Anthony Green and Ilya Markopoulos um, on our September show came up with a better finish than what we had than we had laid out for them. They brought it to their agent. Their agent brought it to us and we changed it on the fly. So we kind of have a deadline like at four forty um, call times four o'clock. The final rundown goes up at 5.15. So when we print off that final rundown at 5.15, that's how your match is going to end. So edits can make be made up until that point. But no, I mean, we don't micromanage. We let the agents kind of handle it. Okay. And I guess what um, you, can, you don't honestly say, like, if they come up with anything, you're not like, no, I don't want that or no, that's not what I want because it's my money. Like, you know what I mean? You don't have this mind. I guess I'm saying is, is like, do you ever, when I say micromanage, I mean like, do you ever ixnay something because you're like, no, that's I'm spending my money, so I want to, you know, I want it this way and this way only, and, and you don't change your mind or whatever the case may be. Yeah, you- a- absolutely. And I just recently did that um, on our August 17th show. We we had stripped Danny Miles of his, of his heavyweight title. Because he was um, he was injured, he wasn't going to be able to defend. So um, and it was unknown how long he was going to be gone. So we stripped him of the title, and Cody, who uh, runs the back, Hunter Ward or Cody Ward. Oh, I know uh, Cody. Yeah, wanted to have Danny go out and relinquish the belt. Yeah. I said, no, we stripped Danny of the title. He, why is he going to go to the ring and hand you the title? You know. I've put the, you know, I've put out the social media. He was stripped. Stripped means we took the belt from him. Doesn't mean he went to the ring. So th- I think that that's the first time that I've actually nixed something that someone proposed to be different than what we needed. All right. So the what we ask anyone when they take over, what was the game plan? Are you going to be the next ECW? Are you uh, going to just make that one building as successful as possible? What was your plan going in? Our plan was to create a product that one brings back our existing fans um, by bringing in new faces and new names as well as um, 
elevating some of the talent that we ha- already had on the roster. Um, our goal is not to become ECW. Our goal is not to become chaotic wrestling. Our goal is to become the best that we can be as APW, draw fans in, and give young students and young wrestlers and even veteran wrestlers a platform to come in and, and perform. Do I want to be successful enough where we're making money and putting money in our pockets? Yes. The first goal was to have September show pay for October show to October show to pay for November show. So we're not losing money or we're not taking additional money out of our own pockets. We've succeeded at that, but we did make one misjudgment. We went to the, the new England pro wrestling hall of fame and we bought a bunch of stuff like APW gimmick stuff and we sold not one item. So the little bit of a, uh, you know, bankroll we had that was saved up was kind of gone. So we've now kind of built that back up. And no, Newburyport, we're solid in Newburyport. We're actually leaving and we're we're going to venture out and go to Beverly. We have two shows in Beverly, Mass at the Beverly Elks and one in January and one in August, which are going to be kind of like our <clears throat> our anchor shows. Our January show is going to be kind of like the culmination of everything from the fall shows. And then the August will be from, you know, starting in February. That'll kind of be the, the blow off show or whatever you want to call it for the, the spring. Um, so you were mentioning um, that you had people like Cody and stiff Mike and so on and so forth. Uh, as far as your talent goes, do you personally, or do you, I have to assume you and Joe are on the same page. Do you guys have the mentality of we should have a core roster and then every now and again, bring a new face in or are you, cause I feel like a trend right now in wrestling is you might have one or two guys that consistently come, but nine times out of 10, you're going to have a new, it's basically like, like six new matches or five matches, or even like three matches are always going to have a new face where your crowd has no idea who they are. So they're not sure how to take them and so on and so forth. Um, do you believe in building a core roster? If so, what made you choose the people that you did? We, we have a core roster we have, um, you know, we've categorized it into guys that we think we can eventually move into competing for the heavyweight title. Then we have that core, that group that would venture in and wrestle for the New England title. Then we have a few tag teams. Tag teams are tough because um, there are a lot of them, and they work everywhere. I mean, we've been lucky enough that Nightbreed decided to come back, Gallo and, and Setherin, and they've been exclusive to us because – of a work situation with Cal. He can only work once a month. They have worked other shows when we haven't had shows in that month, but they are exclusive to APW, which which is good because the fans still love them, even though they had been out of the business for as a team for however long that was. Um, so, yes, we have a core group of guys, and those are guys like Robo, who is over, Vern eh, with the fans. The, the fans love these guys. Danny Miles, Demon Ortiz, who... Uh, Dima, and this goes to the surprises, like Demon Ortiz was retired. Last year at this event um, that just passed the Gilbonk in 2018, he made his return. It was supposed to be three or four shows. Immediately following that event, Joe and I got a message said, oh, by the way, I'm back for good. And so that's kind of been beneficial. And now he's starting to venture off like he just recently had a, a heavyweight title match at, at Chaotic Wrestling. And he's been wrestling for, uh, he wrestled on um, AG's Zero One mm-hmm. uh, Northeast show. So that to me, uh, the core roster and, and having a set group of guys is, is imperative that we do that because that's going to allow us to build consistency in whether we do storylines or just in familiar faces with the fans. And, you know, we did in August, we did kind of do our biggest event ever. We brought in a bunch of future of honor kids we brought in Brian Malonis. We brought in Simon Grimm and that show didn't do as well as we thought it was going to do. So it's a, it's allowed us to reevaluate and figure with to between Joe and I that, you know, local people, 
for what people want to see. They don't want to see Simon Grimm, who was in NXT. You know, Brian Malonis, they love Brian, so they'll come when Brian's there. But they, they, they really had no interest in the future of Honor guys when they were in. So it was a decision we had to make. We do have one of them coming. Uh, one of them actually just competed, I should say, um, on our most recent card against Brian Malonis in a one-on-one match. Uh, but that will be, for now, that will be the last time that we see any of those guys, uh, just cost-wise and in familiar, familiarity with our fans. So so coming in, backing up a little bit, when you're coming in, tell us what you thought the positives and the negatives were of this company walking in the door. The positives were they had a, a very strong fan base. The same people came every month. And I thought that that was, you know, could be built on. So that was a positive if, if it was approached from the correct, correct direction. Um, the negatives were the stigma of APW being a backyard organization. Um, and that, you know, me saying that, I, I'm not trying to insult the guys that were working there before. That was just from my understanding talking to people because i used to once i once i started um working with brian uh malonis we i started going to more chaotic shows i went to top rope shows and i went to some apw shows and that wasn't just the thought locally like that was what people at top rope were thinking that's what people fans wouldn't go to APW because they were considered a backyard organization, untrained wrestlers, I guess you would say. That's what I was going to ask, is if you could elaborate on what you mean by backyard wrestlers. Because to me, backyard, uh, backyard, and I, this is me speaking ignorantly. I, I, I don't, I'm not trying to backpedal or anything. I genuinely don't know. So this is a very ignorant statement. But there's a, there's a promotion in Manchester, New Hampshire. I believe it's WAW or something mm-hmm. like that. That's considered a backyard promotion to me because what I, to my understanding, yeah, they're untrained people. Um, for the most part, everyone who's ever worked for APW, I mean, I worked there once or twice. Um, everyone I've ever been on the show with has been trained, whether or not trained for many years. Um, they, but they've been trained. So, um, I guess, could you, what, what made them a backyard industry? Was it the talent? Was it the way it was run? What was, was it, who was running it? Like, what do you think got that stigma from my, from my understanding and my perception of it? I think it was just the talent level okay. that, you know, they were bringing in some, some talented guys like Vern and Robo and, um, Danny miles was there from time to uh, for Danny's actually been pretty consistent, but you know, um, and these are this is gonna be painful to say, but there were people like the the um, Canadian legend Matt Loudon, who's actually a good friend of mine. There was Joe Moakley. There was um, Cody Ro- Cody Ward. You know, even though they're all trained and they've gone to schools, they um, they were only. APW. You didn't see, like you said, you didn't see Joe Moakley venturing off and wrestling somewhere else, or you didn't see uh, Matt Loudon going off and wrestling somewhere else. Cody would go up and wrestle in Maine. Um, so I think that that's where the stigma was. It was they had a core group of guys that had a certain look that may not have been, for lack of a better term, professional enough. You know, guys wearing just jeans and a t shirt to the ring versus having. Wrestling invested gear. into some into some wrestling gear. I, I think that that's where it came from. Not that they weren't trained. It's just the perception that they gave off based on the way they looked. So if you're still using the same talent, don't you feel that's going to keep the same stigma? I don't because we're blending in um, like Danny Miles looks like a professional wrestler. Um Vern looks like Robo, Travis Gillette, all these guys that we've intertwined in with them um, have, inc- uh, you know, in my opinion, um, changed the perception because we're putting athletic guys in there. And you're not seeing, like, Matt Loudon's retired. He, he you know, he has a family. He, mm-hmm. he left. Cody got injured. Cody's done. Joe Moakley has kind of stepped aside and, and done the stuff in the back. So some of those things um, have. Um, kind of figured themselves out. So I think that that kind of helped change the perception. And again, that may not have been the perception of our fans. That may have been the perception in the industry. And I think that that's, hopefully, that's gone away. I was going to save this question for later, but we're on the subject now. Um, 
we, on a previous episode, had the unequaled one, Todd Sopo. He said, and I quote, that he was future endeavored from APW for complaining that you guys used backyard wrestlers. Any truth to that? We, during our free shows, we have, so every year, APW does Amesbury Days, which is a free show to the public. We do Newburyport Yankee Homecoming. Uh, we do Haverhill Kids Fest. Because of the amount of time that we have for a show, we partnered with Proving Ground, Derek Simonetti, Todd Todd Graham, who, you know, by you know by his own admission, will tell you that they all came from the backyard. Some of their people that they use are trained. Some of their people that they're not. So I think that that's where Todd came from. Is that we had an event in Amesbury where we were focusing on the hometown kid, which at the t- which is Bugsy Stone. Okay. And Bugsy was going over. He was winning the, you know, the the Powwow River Cup. It was a, a new thing that we were doing. And Todd was upset that he wasn't on that that event. So him and Joe had this back and forth through text and Joe decided that he didn't want him in our locker room any longer. So that's kind of where that came from. So we have used some of the proven ground guys, like we use Kevin Giles, um, who's one of their big men, but he has been going to training and training with Stiff Mike. So, and that was part of my, that was part of my conditions for him to be part of APW was that he had to go, he had to get trained, he had to do learn how to do things safely. Um, and you know, we use Dick Lane who's trained, I think by, uh, by, um, at the same place where like JT Dunn was trained. So we've used some of their guys, but I wouldn't consider the guys that we've used backyarders. When I originally started wrestling, I was more or less trained by Derek Mitchell, who also helped train. I believe Matt Loudon is also yep. Matt Leitzer, right? Yeah. We, I was Ryland Renoir at that time. Um, and then Cody, I don't know what they did before then, but they were about as trained as a guy who watching a YouTube video, learning how to fix a car. And that's, it's not a shot at them. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, that's once I realized the training I was getting at chaotic wrestling and the training I was getting elsewhere, that's kind of how they were trained is like, uh, Derek Mitchell was trained by knuckles Nelson, um, for like, I think he told me like six months. And then he just, I think, left and then opened a school. So that's kind of where they got their training. And so that's where people are considered backyarders. Um, but here's the thing is, like, if you learn how to bump and you learn how to um, do all these moves and whatnot, then you got the physical aspect down, the psychology. You can actually learn it on the road and on the go. So I feel like, yeah, in the beginning, like myself and Matt and – Justin and Gunner and Derek, we were all like more or less backyarders. But I mean, I did the thing and paid them. I didn't really pay the money, but I went to a school to learn. I'm sure they picked it up as they went. And to to back on that, when Sopel was running his old show, NLP, I mean, he booked me and I wasn't trained. He booked many a backyarder. You know what I mean? So I don't understand why he doesn't stay grounded and go, eh, I did the same. It is what it is. Uh, Maybe they'll learn as they go and try to be more helpful than negative. Uh, but I see what you're saying is mixing talent that is well known and well, you know, known to be good or decent professional wrestlers with the talent that were considered backyarders may change the perception in uh, in the company. The other thing is, is I think would help, uh, and this is just opinion. I think what would help is booking, and this is going to send a shot at your talent, but booking better talent and what i mean by that is um i'll use beyond wrestling as an example when beyond wrestling came out on youtube uh i thought it was a backyard you know i thought it was a backyard show what got me curious about it is davy richards wrestled on one of their shows and i was like what the what the fuck is davy richards wrestling a backyard show and that's when i think a lot of people i mean me personally that's when i saw it and was just like what the is beyond wrestling. So I know you said that people like Simon Grimm and stuff, they don't want to see it. If you have a core audience and they're seeing the same people all the time, they know who to love and hate. If 
you, I mean, Simon Grimm's a good talent, but he wasn't like the super over guy. He had a cool gimmick at the time, but he kind of blended in with the rest of the talent in WWE. But if you have guys that are kind of like, if you can pay a little extra to get a Josh Briggs on, AG, maybe people that are a little higher in the indie scene, I feel like that would help change your stigma because now you have all these guys like Cody and all them wrestling on shows. Whereas like if the industry has already developed an opinion that you're a backyard promotion, they're going to think that all day. Now, if you start seeing posters where you're like, he might be a little expensive, but let's just say like, if you're like, Oh shit, they're booking orange Cassidy here. You know what I mean? Then it's like, all right, APW's changed. I think I'd like to go work for them. And then maybe it will, you know, right. change the stigma. That's just my opinion though. And and I, I don't disagree. <clears throat> um, like we've reached out to the you know a, a number of people. Like uh, and this is not only us, but Danny Miles, who you know works for Big Time. He wrestles a top rope. Um, like at his request, we've reached out to these people, like Richard Halliday and Josh Briggs and Dan Maff. And it's a lot of it is, is that these guys are so booked and including JT Dunn. I would love, I, I'm a fan of JT Dunn. I would love to have him come in and wrestle Danny miles or someone else. Um, you know, demon, I think JT Dunn and demon Ortiz would tear the house down. It's it, a lot of it has been timing issues, but I think we've put out a wor- the word, and we're, we've also were limited in the number of shows. We only did like four shows, then we took three months off, then we did four more shows. 2020 is a lot different. We have a show every month in 2020. We, we're doing, I think, a total of 13 shows in the, during the 12 months in 2020. So um, hopefully we can get some of those, those names that you're talking about um, in 2APW. But I mean, I... Seems like an overreaction. He's not on one show, and it turns into a whole meltdown about using backyarders and no longer being with the company. I mean, companies don't book everyone every show. What is the big goddamn deal? I mean, maybe I'm missing something, or maybe you weren't even privy to the text and just to, between the two of them. Just but. to play off that, I mean, did you guys plan on using them in the future, or are you guys just completely done with them, like over and done with? Like, how did that? What actually happened? When I when I became part of the company, I looked at it as Todd Sopel was going to be with us moving forward. I didn't know a lot of the guys in the back had issues with him, whatever it may be, his, his attitude. I I only was really at like three shows where Todd worked for APW. So I had no problems with Todd Sopel. Don't have any issues with him. It all stemmed from previous to me being there to the, the, all the, the interaction between him and, and, um, and Joe Moakley through the messaging from that one event that, and just by the way, on that one event, we didn't have Danny Miles. We didn't have Vern Vicala. We didn't have Robo. We didn't have any of our top guys or the guys that we view as top performers with APW on that show. So he was upset over that. And then um, it just went from there. And Joe, you know, with input from other people within APW that we hold in high regard, like Stiff Mike and um, and Louis Ortiz, the decision was that it would just be best to part ways with with Todd Sopel. Have I reached? Have I? I will be one hundred percent honest. I have asked to bring Todd Sopel back to APW. For example, I wanted to have him as a surprise entrant. And our Gilbonk that just happened on October 19th. I wanted to bring him in. We were doing something special after Big Woody passed away. I wanted to book him on that card in a match with Brian Malonis and Demon Ortiz. It was a no because we didn't want Joe and the others didn't want that back in our locker room. So have do I think Todd Sopel can do a good job and, and be a part of APW? Yes, but... Do I want to deal with the aggravation of all the people that I see every day or talk to when we're coming up to shows just for, you know, one match or two shows or three shows? Do I, and it's just not worth it for me. So it sounds like just more of uh, – it sounds like more that Todd was more or less – Unbo- well, not unbooked, but like stop being used because it, it sounded like a locker room decision, not so much a management decision. Like management made the final hammer on the gavel, but 
it sounds like it was more like a locker room opinion more than just management opinion is what you're telling me. I think that that the the locker room opinion played into it, but the ultimate decision not to book him was made was made by Joe and I. Well, I mean, <clears throat> without knowing the situation, I'm kind of on your side a little bit here because when I was a booker, chaotic. We had a big roster, and I'm assuming you guys have a big roster as well. You can't use everyone on every show. So, you know, occasionally I'd say, hey, Julian, I'm going to give you the night off. And, and people would lose their minds like it was, like, the biggest thing in the world. Yeah. And I don't just don't understand it. Like, you're, you're not being, like, removed from the company. I don't know what the big deal is if someone has one indie show off. I don't... Right. I mean, if it's like an NXT tryout, and then you're like, "Stay home, okay, fine." But did you have an uh, more? Did you have an incline of that reaction for the people who didn't work many shows, as opposed to the people that worked? You know, if you have someone like AG who's booked at Evolve, Beyond, you know, Limitless, yada yada yada, and then you have like, I'm just going. Let's just say the Logan Brothers. The Logan Brothers work chaotic wrestling yeah so would you say you have more would you guys i don't know if you deal with it too would you say an influx would come from more of the people that didn't work many shows as opposed to the people that worked well you know what i mean this is me some of the younger guys i could tell weren't necessarily happy about it but they were either smart enough or were told you know just you know you know to roll with it and it happened some guys that were kind of regulars took offense to it and like i said many times i still stay to this day it's nothing personal it's more of a business decision you can't have everyone on every show i would say there's only one or two times maybe that i might have not wanted to book someone because i didn't care for them personally but that's just me and again i think that there are we had a show on september 7th where we had to um, make some tough decisions we didn't have our tag team champions on the show we didn't have our women's champion on the show so those are our two major titles and I think that there were some hurt feelings. They, they didn't understand why we needed to make the business decision to cut those matches from the show. So, yes, I, I think that <clears throat> removing individuals from one show upset some people. Um, and it was actually not the September show. It was the August show. But, again, those are decisions that needed to be made. F- for one, at that time, and I'll be 100% honest, they were financial decisions. You know, we it was the show where we had all the the future of honor guys, the Simon Grimm. You know, you know, AG was on that card, and, and it just needed to be it needed to be done for financial reasons. And some people had some hurt feelings over it, but they were right back on our September show. And you know, I have messages all the time. Why do you hate me? Why are you taking me off this card? Why, why am I not booked for the next three shows? Well, I mean, honestly, I can tell uh, the biggest thing I tell them is that one, it's not personal Two, it's a business decision. And three, we have things going on with other wrestlers that don't tie into you at the moment. So that's why we don't need you for the next two shows. All right, we've uh, got a little over the map, but that's okay. We're going to take a little (laughs) break. We're going to come back, and we're going to discuss more with Michael Morris and Atlantic Pro Wrestling right after this break. Are you a wrestling fan, but you've always wanted to get in the ring? Do you want to follow in the footsteps of superstars like Donovan Dijak and Flip Gordon? Then check out the New England Pro Wrestling Academy at the NEPWA. You can live your wrestling dreams and train at the best pro wrestling school in the Northeast. Check out NEProWrestling.com for information on joining and about their upcoming fantasy camp. It's NEProWrestling.com. Start your pro wrestling dreams today. This is not even my size. Jack, you know what you just did? Yeah, I told the truth. Why would you do a thing like that? And we're back to the uh, Halloween episode of Truth, Justice, and the New England Pro Wrestling Way. We're here with Mike Morris of Atlantic Pro Wrestling. All right. So you take over the company. Any initial negative reaction from any of the boys that said to you directly? I mean, a lot of times, you know, things get said in a roundabout way, but anybody directly say to you, hey, you know, go fuck yourself, or hey, uh, who the hell are you, or anything like that? Uh, I... 
The only person who actually outwardly said that they were skeptical skeptical about me coming into APW, believe it or not, was was probably uh, Stiff Mike or Mike King. Originally thought, like I said earlier, that I was just trying to buy my way in uh, to the business. And <clears throat> but I think I've been lucky enough to work with him and change his perception. Um, and he's become one of my most trusted people. Like if I have something I want to run by him or something that I just question that doesn't seem right, um, he'll be my, he's my go-to and he's told me that I've earned his respect, uh, by the, because I listen to, you know, I listen to the veterans. I, I try to learn. I don't just yup people to death. Not for nothing. Who's, uh, part of the business as wrestling that didn't buy into it. I mean, you think Vince McMahon didn't buy into the WWF? You think that um, Ted Turner didn't buy into WCW? I mean, if you're the business, the owner, yeah, you're buying, you're buying a product. You are, that's how business works. So <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd agree with that statement on his end, but hey, um, teach his own, I guess. Um, so what, any talent you wanted to get rid of coming in the door? Like, I don't want to use this guy. I don't even know why you're using this guy. I want to get in on the flip side, guys, you definitely wanted to keep around. You know, not knowing the the roster um, 100% top to bottom, I wouldn't say there was anybody on the roster that I wanted to just get rid of and never use again. Yeah, I think it was. It's a matter of feeling out. Um, even to this day, there are people that I that are on the roster that I would maybe not use for a few shows, but it would never not bring them back, except for one instance in in my in my uh, experience, and that's. You know, that's, um, and I don't even really want to say his name, but someone has gone a little crazy. <laughs> Somebody has gone a little bit of crazy on the, on the, on the social media, you know. Oh, I know. Um, and it's, uh, Matt's uh, best friend, Sarzan's best friend. Um, so. Does he carry a machete? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so he, you know, threatening to show up at shows and drive people off the road oh, and, and, and all that kind of stuff. It was, it just was too much for us. And the way that he handled himself on social media, we parted ways with them. And that's one person that will never come back to APW. I mean, I know in this business, it's a lot of never say never, but that is a, will never work for APW again, as long as I'm there. And, um, what do you think, um, like, what misconceptions did you discover, like, when once you started doing it? Like, oh, wait, I thought it was this way, and it's not that way. I mean, this is going to sound bad, but there are a lot of men who whine if they don't get what they want. <laughs> um, you know, and I also found that it's very tough to book reasonably priced women. <laughs> that, that is <laughs> yes, honestly true. Yeah. Um, you know, we have some great ladies that wrestle for us and, and Jen, uh, Vanity Vixen and Widow Belmont and Adira. And we've cycled in some other um, like uh, Davey. But I mean, and Chris Statlander has been in uh, once and we'd like to bring her back. But, you know, as they get more notoriety, they start working for these other companies outside of New England. Yeah. Their price just goes up and up and up and up and they're unfortunately for us their price i'm not going to pay and this is going to sound horrible i'm not going to pay a, a a a lady a lady twice what i'm paying one of my top guys so it's just not financially feasible for us well i mean you would if she's going to sell tickets but if she, right <laughs> if she has the drawing power to justify the pay then you'd have no problem doing it the problem is is i think you you probably don't have the confidence that they actually have the drawing power they think they're worth. I would agree with that. I mean, there are a couple I think that would have drawing power. Like I know, um, I know, like people people love Jen. They come and they to see both Nightbreed and Vanity Vixen. So we use them. People love people in this area. Love Kathy. They love widow Belmont. They love mistress Belmont, whatever she, gimmick she's using. They love her. Um, you know, we're finding, we're starting to use, um, the, the, uh, platinum honeys. We're starting to use angel and we're going to book Evie, you know, later in 2020. So these are girls that are in the area that have a following. Um, and then obviously you got people from outside of the area, like, 
Chris Statlander, who will, will bring people in because she is she's wrestled for beyond she's been on smackdown she's had an nxt tryout so people know the name because she's good at getting the promotion out there and the same thing like davy draws people in so i don't mind paying a little bit more for these these ladies because i know they're going to sell even if they sell me 10 more tickets than i had on the last show if they're general admission tickets those 10 tickets have paid for her to you know for us to have her in um, when it comes to your talent and how you book and stuff, there was a question that was put on a post that I had had on the Truth Justice in New England Pro Wrestling Way Facebook, and his name is uh, Jay Fortier. I'm not going to give you his scenario because it's a little ridiculous, but um, I'm going to give you what his core question is. Is um, Basically, one of the questions is, because we're on the topic of uh, kind of the roster deal, he wants to know, like, as a promoter, typically... If you have, let's just say you have a show and you're like, okay, some of the talent's running a little late and blah, 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 blah. Um, I don't know if you've ever dealt with this, but if you had to deal with a situation where you have, let's just say two of your guys, eight o'clock hits, show's about to start and they go, hey, we can't make it. You know, how does, does that put a damper on the show? How do you do damage control? And then he said, um, he has like, a, it's like a two part question. So that happens. And then let's say one of the guys is your main eventer, you know, for that night. What do you do there? And then the other deal is, is next show comes up, they hit you up for a booking. How do you typically attack all that as a promoter, especially someone for APW? Well, we luckily, I haven't experienced a, a last minute, I'm not making the show type deal. You know, we've even had Robo, who um, was very sick. You know, and he made sure to cancel at least a couple of days ahead of time. He's like, I've got the flu. I know it's going to be a, this, that. It gave us time. Um, but obviously, there are extenuating circumstances. If I get a call at 6 o'clock and the show's at 8 and someone's in my main event and they cancel, hopefully it's one of those issues. It's one of those deals where it's, you know, I got in a car accident or it's a family emergency. It's just not that I don't want to drive an hour and a half or two hours or um, the one that I've seen a lot l most recently on this October card that just passed, I've had one, two, three, four, five, five people pull out of the show because they got booking somewhere else. Yes. <laughs> um, luckily, I've been able to replace them. One of them we gave 100% permission because it's a great opportunity for the person. The uh, couple of the others, it's not been, it's you know, they had done it previously and now they're doing it again. And it's ultimately, um, it's ultimately going to cost them future bookings with APW because Joe and I put a lot of work into the creative side and building our events so that they're, they're fun and enjoyable and our fans have a great time. And we can't be promoting individuals that are having matches. Although we all know that it's always card subject to change but if someone is specifically buying tickets to come and see that person, and then that person backs out on us, that hurts us. All right. So when I um, took over the book, I had a conversation with every individual on the roster because I wanted to get everyone's opinion of the company, where they should go, their individual character and all that. Some people, very easy. Some middle of the road. Some didn't care. Some very difficult. Would you say there's anyone that maybe surprised you was difficult to deal with or... Uh, Pretty much, or was there nobody difficult to deal with whatsoever? I suppose that's possible, even though I find it hard to believe. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think with us, it's we use a lot of guys that have developed characters and yeah. developed. You know, Vern has changed. He was the selfie-made man. Now he's deliciously vicious. Um, but it's still Vern Vicalo that goes out to the ring. It's it's not a complete change in gimmick. Yeah. Um, you know, we have um, Big Gun, who's worn a mask and done his thing for 20 plus years. So we've been, I've been lucky. I mean, I don't know if Joe dealt with it before him, but I've been lucky where when it comes to that, you know, established gimmicks and established uh, personalities, I haven't had a whole lot of pushback on that. Where I get the pushback is when we want to see a specific thing happen in a match and 
the wrestler the the two wrestlers in the match think that they have a better way of doing it we actually did early on we actually had a, a scenario where some wrestlers went into business for themselves at the end of the match which didn't sit too well with joe or myself and it was handled immediately now do you rebook those guys or you just like you realize they're not going to work with you or you know they're basically insubordinate so don't i don't need that in my locker room let's just get rid of them um i i don't th- uh, in in this particular instance we we still book this these these individuals um it's because they're fan they're you know they explained why they went off book and what we wanted them to do and when they explained it it was kind of like okay we understand next time run it by us before you go and do it on your own because i would have been 10 times happier if i had known what was going to happen how different did, what they did how much did it differ from what you actually wanted them to do oh someone was handcuffed to a pole and then whipped with a belt and it was literally supposed to be like a just a straight disqualification <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. No, 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 no. How can you justify that? <laughs> well, apparently, completely different finish. Apparently, they got approval from their agent, but their agent never ran it by Joe and I. Okay, so realistically, it's the agent's fault, yes. not the. And, and that was and that was handled with the agent, and it, we haven't had any issues since then. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, I believe everyone believe, there deserves a second chance, so. You had to deal with that once, I right, pal? More than once, but uh, I guess why do you have so many agents? It seems like there's a lot of chefs in this kitchen here. Like, do you think the agents are really necessary? I mean, we uh, we it was something we tried, you know, because when Cody retired, we we made Cody Cody Ward is now the commissioner of APW. He can't take bumps because both of his shoulders are completely shot, and if he has surgery, he'll be out of work for way longer than he really can be so he decided to hang it up um and then you know we we have lewis ortiz and then um stiff mike and um again brian malonis when he's there so i I think we made the mistake of allowing too many chefs in the kitchen and we're we're reeling that back because Sonny Goodspeed has started to to help us and help guide us, and he's worked he worked on um, the biggest match on our last card, and it went off a lot better than I was expecting. I, the you know from start to finish, it was this is what's going to happen, and then he conveyed that to everybody, and it, it 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 came off that way. So we've scaled it back. We literally have um, two agents now that handle the seven matches on the card. Now, are they calling the matches for these guys start to finish, or are they just telling them this is what I want for a finish and help them get to that end? Like, do they allow the workers to tell their story and then just give them the finish and help them tweak the end? Or how does, like, what are the agent's job? It's to talk through. Basically, they are, the the way that we do it, it it might be a little bit different than um, the way maybe another company does it. What we do is the agent is the go-between. So we'll do it. Julia and Tarzan, you guys are in a match. Joe and I have come up with the way we want the match to finish. You guys get together and say... We think that this might be better and come across better for for the for the fans and, and make our rivalry or whatever take it to the next level. They would go to the agent. The agent isn't making the decision. The agent is then coming to Joe and I, and we're giving the stamp of approval or the rejection. The reason we do that is if we don't, Joe and I are going to have fifty people or you know however many people are booked coming at us all at once, and we have other stuff to do. We have to make sure that you know all the music's ready. We have to make sure you know all the behind the scenes stuff. We have to make sure that it's it's going to run smoothly. So that's why we have agents on matches is more of a go between. They're not authorized to approve changes to what Joe and I have come up with. So tech. Technically, you're the manager. 
agents of the supervisor. The other guys are employees. Exactly. Gotcha. Um, all right. So I'm going to jump into uh, some financial stuff because we had talked about earlier how you said like it was a business move and a financial move where I can't book these you know people who want all this money. Um, do you mind discussing what is a budget that APW looks for per show? We like for example, this most recent show was was roughly about sixteen hundred dollars. Okay. That's talent, building, production, truck rental, everything. That was you know, so you guys own the ring? We own our ring, okay. yes. Is it Derek Mitchell's ring? It's Derek Mitchell's ring. Okay. Um Derek is actually Derek left for a while. Mm-hmm. Derek's come back. Um he does he's doing refereeing for us and um he, you know, so we're still using his ring and, um, but so we don't have that extra like equipment. We own all of the audio equipment is owned by us. We don't have to rent it. So that's what we were at about $1,600 for our October 19th show. And we try and stay somewhere in the range of about $1,500 per show. That's talent building and production so uh in a past podcast um it was his first show ever but uh anthony green retro anthony green ran his first show ever for northeast or zero one northeast and he spent almost five grand it was forty five hundred dollars for his first show ever why do you feel his was so expensive as opposed to yours i i i that is a very good question. I, I you know, I mean, I, I saw the talent he had on the show, so I'm assuming that a good portion of that was was talent. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if Anthony had to rent his own rent a ring for the show or what the cost of the building and gardener was. He did. He had to rent the ring. <clears throat> um, so he mentioned on the podcast that he had to rent the ring from Brian Fury. I don't know what he paid for it, um, but what he basically what he had to do is rent a ring. Um, he was hoping the entrance would just be included. Uh, he had to get production going, which was Wayne, who runs the production for Chaotic. He had to obviously rent the building. He had to pay for detail. He also had to pay for the Sunday detail, which was a little more expensive, and then the talent. So right. um, you would say that it's probably heavily talent-based is why he had to pay about 4500 for his first show? I'm guessing talent-based and probably the detail. Yeah. Because we actually um, recently, I said we're going to Beverly, and we looked into going to Methuen, but at the old where Chaotic used to run yeah. the old Knights, Knights of Columbus. Columbus yeah. Because um, in January we're having um, a card that's gonna, you know, and I'll break it here. We're um, we're gonna feature two cage matches on that event. Um, I'm not going to tell you who are in those cage matches, but we're having two cage matches. Um, so we needed a building with a high enough ceiling. Newburyport doesn't give us that. Methuen did. But in order to run in Methuen, we had to have two cops. We had to have two EMTs. So one ambulance and two EMTs. Mm -hmm. So before we even started putting together the list of with the cage rental in the building, we were already at like a thousand dollar. Actually, no, six, six fifty for the building, three something for the cage, and then the two, the four. Um, first responders, we were looking at almost $1,200 before we even booked talent. So I think that is dependent on the town. Like Newburyport, I don't need police. Uh, I don't need EMTs at my, I don't have to pay for a detail. Beverly, don't have to pay for a detail. So that's all town oriented. Um, So, I mean, I'm guessing that between talent and detail probably was a good chunk of his, his budget. Now, uh, do you change? So you told me typically your budget. You're looking about what did you say, sixteen hundred, right? Yeah, between fifteen and sixteen hundred. So fifteen, sixteen hundred. And if the police detail and whatnot is costing you so much for that show, is it worth going back to that event? If not, or if it is, um, do you raise your ticket prices for that specific event to try and make up for it on the back end? How do you, you know, how do you basically balance it out so you can kind of obviously, if you're spending a little more, how do you balance it out? Well, I look at it this way. I mean, if we if we need to increase ticket prices, it, it's going to be a hard decision because one, we recently just in 
February, actually March of last year, of this year actually, we increased our ticket prices and we broke it into groups. We had front row seats, reserved front row seats, $20. Then we introduced reserved second row seats, which is general admission pricing. Just if you pay in advance, you pay general admission rates and you're guaranteed a second seat. And then we typically do $12 for general admission if you buy the tickets online or $15 on at the door. Um, and those ticket prices were accepted, which Joe was kind of skeptical on because they hadn't really raised their prices in a number of years. But I felt that the product we were going to be putting out warranted a ticket increase. But we do know that going to Beverly, that ticket price is going to be a little bit higher for um, some of the some of the seating, and it's just because you know we have the cage. We're bringing we're having. Um, a number of not really big names, but I mean, you know, talent that exceeds, you know, a hundred dollars per, per appearance. So we try and we try and make that up. So it's all a fluid thing and it's all adjustable, but we try not to raise our ticket prices if we can avoid it. So, uh, when you came out that you were a part of this company, I assume your phone and Facebook started blowing up. Yeah, I went from probably about 100 friends on Facebook to, I don't know, I don't even know how many friends I have now. (laughs) But wrestlers, managers, referees, yeah, um, fans, APW fans started following, you know, friending me. I'm not a big Facebook guy unless I'm promoting like an APW show or the seminars or most of my posting I do on Instagram and just share it to Facebook. <laughs> what do you do about uh, promoting your show as far as that goes? Do you use utilize social media a lot? Do you guys do the old school postering? How do you guys go about that? Um, well, in Newburyport, we can't poster like on – you know, on the on the telephone poles, but we do we do poster. We have the you know the little metal racks where we put two. Yeah. So we poster in Newburyport as long as it's on private property, we're good. Newburyport, Salisbury, Amesbury, that area where our show runs. See, even in the Seabrook, New Hampshire, um, and then heavily on the social media, um, whether it's it's both Twitter, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, um, and and I solely you know pretty much do the social media portion. All right, and so um, just backtrack about the financial stuff. I had a question about that. Um, what do you think your most expensive expense is? And um, I'm going to play on the talent too. Um, what is your average talent rate? Our average talent rate, if I put everything in, if I do a regular, you know, just a standard APW card, we're looking probably the average is right around forty to forty five dollars per per you know that that's you know some guys that are making top dollar some guys that don't ask for a lot they come in for you know thirty bucks forty bucks some guys come in for a hundred hundred and twenty five hundred and you know certain guys come in for two hundred um but those are few and far between you know we have so I would say the average. I, I would even stretch it out to forty to fifty dollars per guy, per person, female, male. Do you feel yeah you reach out more to talent, or talent reaches out to you more? Um, I feel like I do a lot of the reaching out, but if you know, I have had a lot of people reach out to us, and you know, we get the resumes, we get the videos, we get the promo pictures, and. Um, the problem is, is that when I go back to them and I ask them how much they want for their show, uh, for their, their show rate, especially if they are from like, we'll say they come from New Jersey. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I'm $50 for the show, but I need travel money. So now it's $200 for me to come up there. I'm not, you know, I'm not paying one person $200 to come up when I can pay, you know, for a carload of top guys, I can pay two hundred for the whole car. So I'd rather bring four guys up than one. Um, so I think that that's where the the business mindset has come from. And uh, when people reach out to us, I, I don't jump at somebody who said like we had the opportunity to have Ace Austin Impact Impact Wrestling's Ace Austin. Mm-hmm. He was in the area. He was in Connecticut. He's like, I'll drive up there. This is my normal rate. Yeah, 
I said, I can't pay you that rate. I can pay you this, plus I can throw you a few extra dollars for gas. He came in for almost 150 less than what he originally asked because it was just a two-hour drive, yeah. and he wanted to work. So guys like that, absolutely, I'll pay someone you know that's closer if they're willing to deal um, and negotiate and not stick to their their dollar. You ever get? I got a lot. The guy who wanted to come in, he want more money. I would go to Jamie, or whatever, and sometimes get them more money. But then they would be like, "I want this, and I need this, and I want that." And I'm just, I can't think of any other business where you ask to be hired, you ask to be paid, and then when you get it, you lay down the law of what your boss essentially is telling you what to do. Yeah. I mean, you ever come across that? I actually, the only person that's ever told me that a decision. Like he couldn't take the pinfall. Yeah, was Ace Austin, <laughs> and the reason he did that is because at the time, and I'm I'm not even sure if he's lost a match at Impact, but he was on. They were rolling this where he's undefeated in, in Impact. So, yeah. So luckily, we had in that match. It was him versus Danny Miles versus Bear Bronson. So it was a triple threat match. So we didn't have to have Ace take the pin. So that worked out for us. But if someone said to me. I want you to hire me. I want you to pay me this much money. And we agree to that. And then they come in and say, oh, by the way, I can't lose. I can't take a pinfall. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm not bringing you in to face my heavyweight champion and you become my new heavyweight champion. So, yeah. well, it'd be one thing like Honky Tonk Man, when he came to Chaotic, he laid out all his things before we agreed. He was agreed to get paid. So that's to me is a little different. A lot of these guys will... They just say, I want this money. You get them. And then they start adding all these right. other... To me, that's just ridiculous. Right. If, uh, and I agree. If it's negotiated beforehand that yeah. A, B, C, and D are going to happen, and you agree upon a price and that that stuff's going to happen, that's fine. But it's after you agree to book them, agree on a rate, and then they say, oh, by the way, I need C and D to happen as well. That's where I run into problems. Uh, and I just want to say, again... Because uh, this was a question I asked, and I think we just avoided it, but I'm going to go back to it. What do you think your most expensive expense is? Do you think it's talent? Do you think it's buildings? Do you think it's my most our most expensive expense is, is built is is excuse me is a talent? Okay, yeah, because I mean we we've been lucky in Newburyport. We uh, pay a fairly reasonable rate. So I mean, uh, out of our fifteen our fifteen hundred dollars show, roughly between nine hundred and a thousand is talent. And the, the rest is building and production. Now, are you making money, are you breaking even, or are you guys still kind of losing a little bit, trying to figure out how to make it up in the back end? No, we're actually pulling, you know, not enormous profits. We're, we're pulling, you know, we might make five or $600 profit on a show after everything's said and done. But Joe and I have been committed to putting that money back in APW. Neither of us are taking any money. It's all going back into the company. Like I said, you know, September show, our goal was September show to pay for October show, so on and so forth. Um, but we've also made the commitment that if, you know, we make $500 profit, it goes back into the company because we know that the ring we have is 12 years old and we're going to need a new ring soon. And neither of us want to take our own money and buy a new ring. Yeah. We'd rather just take it from what we've accumulated from APW. So what is your standard draw? Like right now, most shows, if you had to average it out, like what are you typically drawing every show? We are drawing on average 200 people. That's not bad. That's a lot better than what APW used to be doing. Yep. Um, and the Gilbonk, uh, I can tell you, last February... Um, which was our full force elimination, which is our Royal Rumble, our, our Survivor Series type. Brian Malonis was on the card. His wife was running the front door, and he gets a text message before the show starts. We need more chairs. We did over 320 people at that show. We're on pace to do about 310 for the December show that we have this year. So That's it sounds pre pre advanced shows. So, I mean, but our average show, you know, some shows we have 150, some shows we have 250, some shows we have 200, but I would say the the least amount we've had since I've been a part of the company is about 150. So it sounds like APW is doing really well since you've been in. 
Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's doing what Joe and I had planned out to do, and hopefully it will continue to do that. What do you think is the biggest change you have brought to the company? I think, again, I think it's my, you know, the business sense that I have. I, I can say, I can look at it and say, you know, this wrestler at $400 is not beneficial for us to bring in um, over these three guys that our fans love. So I think that, and, and also, you know, not spending money when money doesn't need to be spent, I guess, you know, um, what do you mean by that? Like on talent or cause, and I'll, I'll, I guess I'll use this as an example. Um, I felt like Catholic wrestling did like two really good shows, but like drew really well. And I want to say it was like the third show. They immediately, like I felt put all their expenses into Mick Foley. You know what I mean? Like they did really well these two shows, and all of a sudden, like a third show in after Brian and all of them took, you know, Brian took over, it's just boom. Uh, here's Mick Foley, and if you don't pull the money to justify that draw, you know, basically you're you're probably going to lose your profit. I don't know the figures on it, but to me, you right. know, it's it's like you said, it's I feel like that's spending money you didn't really have to spend. Yep. Yeah. I mean, if I'm looking at it from an honest view. We, our August show, the one where we had Simon Graham, Brian Malonis, Future of Honor guys, that show, we did not make money. That, that was the first show where, um, since I've been on, that we did not either even either break even or make money. Uh, because, we, you know, I'll be honest, we're not making money every show, but we're at least breaking even on every show. Uh, but that was the first show that we lost money on, and that that's what allowed us to reevaluate and say, okay, do we really want to bring in these former um, WWE guys that want five hundred dollars a show plus you have to pay a portion of their travel? Like that was the deal we worked out with AG because he was already in town. We you know so for one guy we were paying over six hundred dollars to have him on our show, hoping that it was going to generate us some buzz didn't happen. Um, so we've stepped back and reevaluated and said, you know, yeah, let's, let's, let's stay more to the guys that we know. Like, like I said earlier, I would love to bring in JT Dunn. I would absolutely love to bring in Josh Briggs because I think that those guys are developing a, a following and um, a name for themselves that will help legitimize APW. It doesn't need to be Mick Foley or Simon Grimm or, you know, we had an opportunity to bring in Matt Taven, but do I, I mean, just to do a, a meet and greet, but do I want to spend what Matt's asking to just bring him in for a meet and greet? It's, <clears throat> those are the tough decisions when All it right. comes to money. Let's talk wrestling school for a minute. APW does have a wrestling school, correct? Uh, we did. Uh, actually, the wrestling school is now owned by Stiff Mike, Wrestling Academy Revival. Um, we still have that working relationship where when his students are ready, they're going to work APW shows. Uh, a few of them are, uh, were just on our October 19th show. Uh, one young guy who used to be up in Manchester at WAW when they had their whatever went on with them just recently, he left, came down and started training with stiff Mike. What's his name? Uh, Cam Hall. Oh, I know Cam. Yeah. Yeah. I know Cam. Um, so Cam's actually going to be a part of, um, our December show. He's going to be on a, one of our full force elimination teams with, uh, with Larry Huntley and, and lumber Jake. Um, so it's not officially your school. You guys just have a working relationship. Right? No longer are officially our school. Just a working relationship. Financial decision you guys decided to make? Or? It was Joe and I deciding that um, we wanted to put 100% of our efforts into APW and um, didn't want to. You didn't want to lose um, or put. Fi yeah, basically it was. We didn't want to put any money into the school. Um, because it wasn't growing. We had the same four students. Um, and, and good thing, you know, Mike, Mike King took it over and he's seen uh, an influx of students. Um, and it seems to be doing pretty well. Uh, we had Brian Fury on the show talking about wrestling schools. He said that there's uh, some heat between wrestling schools. Do you uh, know of any heat that exists between that school and any of the other schools? Do they hate or dislike uh, the New England Pro Wrestling Academy for them thinking they're better than everyone else or anything like that? Is that stigma going around? I personally, you know, I, this is one of those touchy things because there's this this misconception, I guess, that 
APW is trying to compete with Chaotic or Wrestling Academy or Revival is trying to r- compete with New England Pro Wrestling Academy. C- c- specifically them or just every school in general? Just every school in general. Okay. Um, so you're just using them as I'm an just example because of examples. what we're bringing up. Right. Okay. So, um, you know, I have ne- I, I've met Brian once. I was actually supposed to go over and, and kind of uh, meet him at the school, but you know, I've had some personal stuff, so I haven't had a chance to get over there because I want to be, I want to, I want APW to be, and Julian and I have talked about this. I want APW a place where New England Pro Wrestling Academy students, when they are ready to get in the ring, they can come over to APW and they can hone their skills on our platform before they move on to other, other shows or even work a chaotic show. Um, I don't want this stigma to be like we don't want to work with with new england pro wrestling academy because of the you know because of some imaginary beef that there is between companies because that's exactly what it is any any it's imaginary there's nothing negative i mean it would be crazy not to try and have some sort of positive relationship with the biggest most respected school in in the northeast i feel like a lot of that stuff is just wrestler insecurity. Um, wrestlers, I feel like, are very insecure human beings. Um, and I'm speaking from experience, too. It's just, and whatever you, whatever reason you may be insecure about, um, I feel like that's where a lot of that stuff is derived from, is like you're insecure about this, or you have a second thought about that, and so you create a reality in your head, and then you project it like it's real. Um, I can tell you, they were, back in the day, there was uh, a very clear-cut, like, F those chaotic guys because they think they're better than everyone. Malonis, Todd, um, Tommaso, they can all tell you that it existed. It was, I, there was a little bit of it when I was still wrestling. Cause like every now and again, I'd go to like top rope and you'd say, Oh, there's a chaotic guy. But I feel like now I ask people who are in the business now and I don't, you don't hear that too often. It's like, Oh, this guy's a chaotic guy or whatever the case may be. So like, I think you said, nails it on the head is I think it's all imaginary beef more than anything. Yeah. I mean, I look at it this way, you know, I don't, you know, for me, if you're going to come in and you're going to do, you're going to give my fans and me what I ask of you, which is a solid professional match, your professional backstage. I don't care if you're trained at chaotic. I don't care if you're trained at test of strength with slick. I don't care if you're from the top rope school. I don't care if you're from war. I don't care if you're from, you know, create a pro, create a pro wrestling in New Jersey. Where you're trained doesn't matter to me as long as you come in and do put on a hell of a match for my fans and are respectful to me and the other people in the locker room. And the little noise we're hearing in the background, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> is that of Tarzan Taylor's new daughter. She's adorable. So if you hear baby screaming, that's what that is. I think she says we're not being asking hard hitting enough questions. Yeah, <laughs> that's just, that's true. Right now, wrestling is big, like really big. It's like exploded. I mean, you got WWE has become huge with the Fox deal. NXT is on USA. AEW is on. Impact is still existing. How do you think that's affected? Like, I don't want. I, I don't know if mom and pop wrestling company is the term to use, but how do you think, if at all, that's affected the independent wrestling scene? Honestly, I you know I think that um, the independent wrestling scene is is going to potentially see a boost because the the guys, for example, most recently AEW was in Boston. If you did not feel the electricity when MJF hit that ring during the sequence with Cody yeah. um, to help save where they thought he was going to hit Cody with the steel chair or whatever it may be. That was a kid who honed his skills here in New England. He worked Limitless. He worked Chaotic. He worked all these promotions, very similar to what Richard Halliday is doing and, and being part of MLW. I think that the, the, the everyday pro wrestling fan wants to be able to say, I saw that guy that's now on TV at my local Elks two years ago. Or I'm a fan. I've been a fan of that guy since he started. So I think that the influx of the the large organizations is helping independent wrestling. Uh, I feel like the boom in professional wrestling has been heavily caused by independent wrestling. Um, reason being is because there was no alternative. 
There was just WWE. So with WWE being the only thing available, people started getting sick of it. Because one, your stars aren't getting over, which is, you know, no one wants, there's no one that can cut a promo that you want to go watch the next day. There's no one that goes on TV that you're like, I need to go see what they say or do next, next show. You could miss a Raw and, you know, next month, watch it again, pick up right where you left off because nothing feels you know, genuine anymore. Now the last decade, WWE's owned the business. So, and so I think people started turning to independent wrestling and that's, what's creating a boom is you had alternatives. And I think fans, once they realized they had no alternative, had a chance to appreciate other independent wrestling companies because they can say here, here's talent we've never seen before. They're actually pretty damn good. And I feel like that boom just kept rolling and rolling. And there were people like Beyond Wrestling, Limitless and stuff who capitalized on it. I feel like it's good because there's a lot of opportunity out there. But do you feel like APW could potentially capitalize on this by utilizing these, what a lot of people like to refer to them as indie darlings? Um, Or do you want to create your own indie darlings? Like, how do you, you know what I mean? Do you want to capitalize on the, the movement or do you want to just focus on, APW being APW. Yeah, we certainly do want to uh, capitalize, you know, on the the indie darling, as you would say. Um, and, and again, I think I mentioned some of those names earlier: the Josh Briggs, the Christian Casanovas, the the JT Duns, the Richard Holidays. All of these guys that are making a name for themselves in other independent organizations, I would definitely like to see come through APW. Um, hopefully we can make that happen. If not, we will focus on building the talent that we have so that, you know, the Vern Vicalos who, you know, I, I, I believe that and just in the, the almost two years I've been with the, I've seen kind of a shift in Vern, you know, he, he's, ta- it seems like he's taking it a lot more seriously over the last, six to eight months. Um, and, and I think that that boom, I guess we can say with the, um, three nights of WWE programming and the addition of AEW and even beyond on Thursday nights and ring of honor and MLW and, and limitless. I think that all of these larger companies, I guess you would say are motivating those individuals who have been with the smaller promotions to maybe take, pro wrestling a little bit more seriously and it's no longer just a a weekend activity it's it some of them are turning it into you know what they want to do in the future and just to play off what tarzan was saying is um now you have alternatives on tv uh, before the reason why i feel like everyone went to the independence is because as i just stated there was no alternative and so it was just like all right wb's kind of like stale at this point what else do we have oh shit Local independents are amazing. Holy fuck, these guys are talented. And so now there's an uplift. Now the broadcast networks, there's, like he just stated, like Tarzan stated, there's TNA, there's AEW, there's NXT. There's So now you have alternatives. Do you think you're going to see a decline in local independence because now you basically have all these alternatives on TV again? I hope not. (laughs) Um, No, I I think that the good thing for us is that all of these alternatives are on Monday through Friday when people are sitting home relaxing from the end of the week or from the end of the workday. Whereas, you know, you have uh, most of your independent promotions run on Saturday nights or Sunday afternoons or Friday nights. So I look at it as the casual wrestling fan who may not be able to afford to go to a WWE show or even an AEW show. It's they're more apt to buy a twenty dollar front row seat to come to a local professional wrestling event. Well, um, the biggest thing I want to bring up when it comes to bookers is we all have a style or things we like, but you can't book what you like all the time. Has that ever been a problem? Like you might like luchador wrestling, but the fans of APW don't want to see luchador wrestling, or you might like hardcore wrestling, but they don't want to see that. Have you had any trouble adjusting to? separating the things in wrestling you like to what your audience likes well luckily for me i'm more of a purist yeah i I like the old school you know two wrestlers get in the ring they they tell a story for 10 minutes they don't have to beat each other with with straps or tacks or 
tables. They just get in there and, and tell that story. So that's kind of the approach we've had. Yes, we've had street fights. We've had, you know, we've had... Um, gimmick matches. Gimmick, gimmick matches, submission matches, whatever it may be. I quit, loser leave APW, those, all those types of matches. But when it boils down to it, I look at the way that I book and the way that Joe and I book collectively as wrestling as at its purest form uh, two guys two women uh, two tag teams go in and tell a story for however amount of time they're allotted and i it, it's getting over well with the apw fans would you say something in wrestling you don't like not necessarily like women's wrestling or hardcore wrestling or high spots or I, I think I think I'm uh, I'm gonna point out a match that I just saw in AEW where it seemed like Sammy Gavea pulled out every finishing move on the face of the planet. You know when he was in there with uh, with Cody. You know it just yeah. those types of matches where you feel like they they had to hit every big signature move that they have in their bag. Um, I think those are the kind of things that I dislike about wrestling. Now, if your fans that's what they wanted to see, would you? honestly be able to adjust your booking style to accommodate them yeah i i mean i would adjust to what the fans if the fans tell me they want a whole entire hardcore core event i'll give them a, every match on my card will have a hardcore theme to it so where would you draw the line as far as um because you just stated that you would give like if you're if your fans wanted you know all hardcore night or ladder matches or whatever you would give it to them. Where do you draw the line where you keep them from controlling your show? Uh, you know every show. Honestly, I think the best way to keep them from controlling the show is to give them a solid product every <clears throat> every every uh, time that we put a, a show together in in um, in Newburyport, Beverly, wherever it may be. Um, and, and keep things fresh. Make sure that uh, I, I'm a big fan of um, surprises. Me too. So, uh, for example, on October 19th, we had our Gilbonk. The biggest surprise of that was the return of Apocalypse. He, um, you know, retired. His last match was with John Poe, end of 2017. But we felt that similar to like what we did last year with Demon Ortiz, nobody, Demon Ortiz told us in july that he would come back he also threatened to kill me and joe if we told anybody so <laughs> um that does a lot so nobody knew literally until he was in the building and it was he was in the building minutes before he was to go through the curtain so that's where you know i think if we keep things fresh with surprises mixed in and and solid entertainment that takes the control. The, the the fans won't need to have the control of, of the show or, or wanting to see specific things. All right, let's talk your current talent and get your, uh, your, your heavyweight champion now, one Danny Miles. What's your thoughts on Danny? Well, um, Danny Miles is a very hard worker. He's very focused, you know, proud to have him as our champion. Unfortunately, he just recently turned heel, uh, joining in a, in a, in a group – uh, as I said back in August, he was we stripped him of his title. Um, on August 19th, he defeated Anthony Green to become the two-time APW Heavyweight Champion. But in the midst of that, he he created a new faction, so to speak, with him, Vern Vicalo, Travis Gillette, um, and Joe Moakley, where uh, they ultimately screwed um, Demon Ortiz out of the title, thus putting the title on our New England champion, Vern Vicalo. So, you know, we have faith in all of our champions as performers, but we may not always agree with the way they go about things. I mean, but, okay, so there you got Joe involved in this faction again. I mean, is that really necessary? The, um, I, I think the reason why Danny brought Joe in uh, to the faction was more or less because our fans hate Joe Moakley. <laughs> And I mean, it's to the point where Joe, do, uh, Joe doesn't even break curtain. You, they hear his music and everybody in that building is ready to throw something at him when they see him. So I think for them and what they hope to accomplish by bringing in the co-owner of the company to join their faction, I think was a smart move on their behalf, whether you like Joe Moakley or not as a, as a performer. Um, 
I relate this to, let's just say WWE. Do you as a fan get sick of seeing Stephanie McMahon in the spotlight, Triple H in the spotlight, Shane McMahon in the spotlight? If they were just public figures or, or uh, for lack of a better term, figureheads. Like, for example, if Shane McMahon wasn't in a match on every pay-per-view or on SmackDown and he just came in and he was making decisions or, you know, if, if we go back to the day of, um, you know, the, uh, uh, what I forget the name of the faction where it was Vince McMahon, the undertaker, the corporate, the corporate ministry. Yeah, the corporate <laughs> ministry. If, if it's there, there just to be a figurehead or, uh, the, the talker of the group, I have no problems with it. But it's when they get involved and they wrestle. Like, Triple H has done a good job with NXT. You know, he's brought that along. And we see Triple H, he comes around once a year to wrestle at WrestleMania now. I think he's done a good job with that. I would like to see, And I think that that's kind of where they're going with this. Joe is the most hated guy on a- in APW. And whatever you say about Joe, whatever your personal feelings are, the guy can cut a friggin' promo. And he can get people to hate other people. And I think that that's why Danny, Vern, and Travis, all baby faces, partnered with with Joe Moakley in this instance. So he's going to be more of a managerial role, not so much an in-ring talent. Exactly. Okay. In that sense, if if because that fits the description of what you said, you're okay with Shane McMahon, Stephanie, all them being, but if he's an in-ring talent and he's putting himself in the forefront, then, I mean... You can see where that becomes the Markish move again. So I can see where uh, Tarzan was going with that question. All right, up next, the New England champion, Vern Vaccaro. Give us your two cents on Vern. Well, uh, Vern, you know, uh, again, Vern has just recently paired up with Danny, and they actually just screwed Luis Ortiz out of the, or Demon Ortiz, out of the New England championship. Um, and we will. Uh, you know, we're going to have to see where that goes. That That's going to be very, very interesting. Um, uh, we've, we've actually just been informed that both our heavyweight champion and our New England champion will not be there in November. So I feel bad for Ilya, who has to step in the ring with Luis Ortiz after he just got screwed. Is there anything negative you think Vern brings to the table? Um from from our aspect no i mean he, he's always got a good attitude he, he does what we ask but no 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 negative things to say about Vern. all right uh women's champion widow belmont yeah uh kathy who doesn't love kathy i mean you know you know besides the fact i think everybody in the business is scared of her brother so <laughs> <laughs> um you know and that's someone that we've tried to bring back as a surprise mm-hmm. but john is he is he's done with he's professional right. wrestling yeah um so you know she just cashed in you know angel sinclair defeated vixen and on october 19th that was the last day that she could cash in her cash and carry contract so she cashed in, and, and our women's title changed hands twice on that one night. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing where things go with Ed Hunt and uh, and Kathy. Do you think she brings anything negative to the table? Do you think there's something missing? With Kathy, I think the thing that's missing is she's vicious, but I think that the thing is she... No matter how hard she tries, she just can't get, you know, she can't be a heel. I think that that's one of the negatives, you know, no matter, it's, it's tough because you want a, a character to go in one direction and the fans are telling you, no, that's not the direction that's going to go. Typically, uh, fans can read uh, bullshit immediately. Yeah. Um, and I agree with you. Kathy's just too sweet. And I've said, my opinion has always been that Kathy should be babyface. She's naturally just a really sweet person, but I think she likes the dark side of things. You know what I mean? Like that look and that feel and that whole perspective. But unfortunately, like when I watch her, she can't make that happen. Right. I can feel it's a nice person trying to be this way as opposed to if Kathy was just Kathy, she'd be super over. Right. And, and, you know, and, and I'm saying this with all due respect, and that's why we put her with what I think is one of the biggest assholes in, in New England independent wrestling and Ed Hunt. And that still hasn't turned Kathy heel. So, yeah. All right. The tag team champions, Nightbreed. 
Yeah, I mean, Nightbreed, you got um, Setherin, who 20 plus years, you know, um, former trainer at uh, New England Pro Wrestling Academy, tra- trains on Wednesday nights at war. He GFID, uh, brother. Yeah, um, twice a day. Um, <laughs> but, and, and Gallo, I mean, they are great. They work well together. Um, they take good direction and they, they convey what we want them to convey. But I was genuinely surprised at how over they were the first time they went through the curtains at APW. Everybody kept telling me people are going to come and see Nightbreed. People, and I'm the type of person I got to wait to see it to believe it. And I I believed it. And and they're you know they are you know this this is uh, uh, as I announced on October nineteenth. They have gone through all of the top tag teams that we have in APW. They've we've brought tag teams in like the Breakfast Club and Team España and the Bellow Twins, all these teams from around New England and, and New York, and they have defeated them all. This is their second title reign. They got screwed out of it by uh, Jake Jake Sargent, son of the Gun, um, who's now just dealing with personal issues with his father, uh, Big Gun. But on November twenty third. They, as announced on October 19th, they'll be wrestling Kilanova, uh, Royce Bishop, and Christian Casanova for the APW Tag Team Championship. So we, we've had to go out and find talented teams to come in to, to give Nightbreed a chest because they've, they've pretty much gone through the entire APW Tag Team division. I grew up watching Nightbreed. Um, I was 14 years old. I used to watch you know Tarzan Taylor, Matt Spectro, his brother, um, Marcus Vincent or Mark Vincent I used to watch Nightbreed. I was a huge fan of Nightbreed because, and I think it's this way to this day. Um, even when I see them in photos and stuff, they have a different look than everyone right now. If you look on a wrestling show, nine times out of 10, things are going to, the two things you're going to see is someone's going to be wearing jeans and a t-shirt or everyone's going to have wrestling trunks, kick pads every time. Wrestling trunks, kick pads, wrestling trunks, kick pads, and then you have either clean cut or everyone has a beard and long hair. They just have a different look. And I think that just their look alone makes you want to see them. You know, that was at least from my perspective when I was a kid, it's just like I would see like wrestler, 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 and then like, holy shit, who are these guys? You know, so um, I can see where that would be an attraction. So it's been about two years now. Would you say you're happy with what you've done in your experience in APW? I would 100% say that I'm happy, and um, the experience has been great. A lot of learning has gone on, both you know, um, direct from veterans and just from watching how other people uh, present themselves. And I've also been lucky enough, like I've known – I've had some great talks with Johnny Vegas. Johnny and I have known each other since I was 18 years old. Yeah, he uh, told me. He said I'm, he used to uh, like coach a yeah, coach my Babe Ruth baseball team. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I'm almost 50 years old. I, I'm going to be, you know, I'm I'm 46 years old. So, I mean, we're going. That's almost 30 years that, that Johnny and I have known each other. And then obviously my my relationship with Brian Malonis, you know, giving me good advice and you know telling me. That, you know, if someone said something like that to me or bitched and complained like that, I'd be like, they're out when he was booking a chaotic. He wouldn't. He's like, he's like, no, he's like, we don't need them anymore. I don't need them in my locker room. Yeah. Why do you need the hassle? Right. So and then obviously, as I said earlier, Stiff Mike has been has been uh, a big part of it. Same with Luis Ortiz. You know, they, they want to see APW succeed. And I think that the personalities that Joe and I have have meshed well together, which has made it a, a, a success so far. And what would you say to anyone who's inspiring to either buy into a company or become a booker? I would say be prepared for a ton of emails. <laughs> um, be prepared to uh, be given every opinion that you could ever expect when it comes to uh, this should go this way or that should be this way or you should do this or we should do that. But if you do decide to do it, make sure you're 100% committed and make sure that you're not willing to be walked all over. You know, you have to have hard skin. And, and that's one thing I've lucky enough to have been given by my, my, my parents. So 
And never have you ever come across the, how oh, the fucking hell with it, do whatever the hell you want, throw your arms up in the air because you just can't deal with the, the back and forth with somebody before? Um, not, not yet. Not, not to this point. I have not had that, that moment. You know, maybe on our free show, you know, the shows where we put on for the public at our fair shows, it's just like whatever. Because those, those we pause any storylines. We, you know, uh, it, spot it's, shows. Yeah, go out as long as you're safe. And my fans and the fans that are out there love what's going on. Whatever, you know. But as for our regular ticketed events, I, I, I haven't gotten to that point yet. Well, you're still new. <laughs> on that note Julian you know what time it is that I do sir it's time for the, the Fantastic, Fantastic Four. Four Fantastic Four the Fantastic Four Michael Morse is the same four questions that we ask all of our guests here on the show and, and as you being an avid listener you told me earlier <laughs> um, I'm sure you know what's coming so I'm going to start off with question one uh, as a new promoter slash owner booker um, of APW, what would you say you were most proud of? I am most proud of, um, believe it or not, the roster, the guys that we put the faith in to go out there month over month, show after show, to put on a quality, put out a quality product for our fans, and that the the work that they put in for myself and, and the company. All right, question two. So far with your dealing in professional wrestling, what is, if any, your biggest regret? My biggest regret would actually, believe it or not, be the fact that uh, um, I didn't get into it sooner. Or um, I didn't stick to the learning the in-ring stuff, you know, learning how to bump. Because I've started actually going out in front of the crowd as managing partner Mike Gerard, And, you know, I've it's been made clear by a few people in the back that no wrestler should, be, one, ever touch me because I don't know how to bump properly or whatever, um, which I feel takes away from my character. So I think that that's the biggest thing I would say I've regretted so far. All right. So my favorite question next is with your entire dealings, uh, dealing with APW or wrestling in general, uh, would you, who would you say you hate or strongly dislike the most? And will you name them? <laughs> um, the only person that I've had a major issue with, and I wouldn't say that I hate them cause I, I try not to hate anyone. I strongly dislike, um, just because of the way um, he handled specific situations is uh, with us and other companies um, is Buddy Romano. Oh, I know. I saw the <laughs> I saw the picture. He gave you the big bird. Gave yep. it to the office. Yep, to LPW. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I would say you know, and again, it's not that I hate him or um, I, but I think that that would be the the one person. And do you feel it's just because he was disrespectful to everyone and, and just doesn't handle himself professionally? Uh, that would most that is one hundred percent the reason. Okay, you know, I, I when I first met Buddy, we had a good relationship. Um, he had some personal stuff go on and kind of went off the rails, and you know, said some stuff that you really can't take back. So, and I just want to. Uh, tag on to that question just because this was something I wanted to ask earlier, but since we're on the subject, um, as a promoter and booker and stuff, is there anyone that you, aside from Buddy Romano, that you really just don't want to ever deal with ever again? Like in general, the people you're just like, nope, fuck those guys. Um, you don't have to go into details, you just name a list. Honestly, you know, that's, I mean, I've already said that I tried having Todd, Todd Sopel back in APW, but my business partner doesn't want that to yep. happen. Um, I would say Buddy Romano is the only one. All right. All right. What Question four. What does the future hold for Michael Morris and APW? Well, hopefully it holds growth, whether it be Beverly or other cities. Um, getting the APW name out there outside of Newburyport and, and, <clears throat> but I want APW to become a, a name that is respected in, in New England, you know, a, a name that when people are, are talking about independent wrestling shows that are running on a Saturday night and it's 
APW versus Lucky Pro or or Let's Wrestle, people are choosing APW because we've built the reputation that we're going to put on a hell of a show for three and a half hours on our Saturday night. Right. So I want to thank you very much for being on the show. It's been a pleasure. Yes. Now come to our plug part of our show. Where can people find you on social media? Um, on all all platforms of social media, it is Atlantic Pro Wrestling, and um, that's Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Just Atlantic Pro Wrestling, no other. Just, just Atlantic Pro Wrestling, yeah. Perfect. All right, and uh, plug also shows. What shows you got coming up? Uh, we have November 23rd in Newburyport. Um, that is being headlined by, um, as I said earlier, it's, it's Luis Ortiz versus Ilya Markopoulos. And Nightbreed versus uh, Christian Casanova um, and Royce Bishop in Killanova. And we are also having a VIP table service match where Robo is wrestling Club Cam. Um, oh, fantastic. <laughs> this is so it's a it's a tables match, only it's Cam's version yes. of the VIP service uh, <laughs> VIP table service match. So that should be a good one. I'm a huge fan of uh this club cam gimmick. I tried to tell him that he didn't believe me, but I'm, I'm genuinely a huge fan of it. I like his promos. I need more of them. I feel like there's not enough content on out there on it yet, but um, yeah, I'm a big fan. Yeah, no, I mean, we, you know, we like club cam and, and him and Robo have been kind of going back and forth. So we'll see where that, that comes from where Perfect. that goes. Perfect. All right. Julian plug time. Where's our social media. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as always, you can find Truth Justice in the New England Pro Wrestling Way on Facebook. It is a like page. Please go by, give us a like, uh, leave comments, concerns, whatever the case may be. Let us know who you'd like to hear from or whatever. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter at Pro Wrestling Way. Obviously, download us on any major podcasting app that you see fit. Uh, like, subscribe, give us a star rating, leave comments, concerns, questions, anything that you'd like to know, uh, see, or hear on Truth, Justice, in the New England Pro Wrestling way. I want to do a quick plug, a little off subject, but um, my nephew, Jamie Hills, he has a podcast. It's called uh, We've Got Some Work to Do Now. So if you uh, wouldn't mind going over, giving a listen or a like, you can find it on all major podcast apps. Um, I believe it's just started, and I believe the concept is they review every episode of Scooby-Doo ever made. So oh. if you could do me a favor and go listen to my nephew's podcast, I'd appreciate that. Uh, your nephew is named after your wife? <laughs> my nephew is actually named after my father, James. Ah. <laughs> it's just a coincidence I met and married a woman named Jamie. <laughs> All right, Michael, thank you very much for being on the show. We really do appreciate it. We hope you come back someday. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we'd like to have some sort of round table. Maybe uh, if we can get it going, some sort of deal where we have a bunch of bookers in a room to kind of have almost like a debate and see where everyone's minds are at and whatnot. Big plans for Halloween? Um, I am actually going to be in Florida. I'm going to Disney. Not so scary Halloween? Uh, no, we're not going to that, unfortunately. Oh. <laughs> I'm going down to actually run um, a 5K and a half marathon. So. No kidding. That sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but it is well. at Disney. It is at Disney. That is true. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to us. We always uh, want to hear your feedback. Give us a like on social media. Give us your comments, questions, people you'd like to see on the show. Ask us questions. Were we too nice to Mike or were we not mean enough? We always want to hear from you. We generally want your feedback. We try every week to make this podcast better than it was the week before. And go out and support local New England wrestling, the greatest area in the country. For professional wrestling go on and enjoy it julian anything else dad what are you doing for halloween uh not much probably just gonna stay at home if claudia wants to go out we'll take her out but overall just doing what i do best buddy one of my factoids sleeping and relaxing <laughs> all right thank you and as always join us once again for another episode of truth justice and, and the, the new, new england, england pro wrestling, wrestling way, way.